What's going on, good people? This is Dyron back live with my guy Cordero. What's going on, man? Nothing much. Like I tell Byron, man, been on that 10x rule, just trying to 10x everything, trying to do more. Yeah, you got a 10x, I mean, you got a 10x. Uh, if you didn't check in last week, last week, I think it was last week, Cordero came on to the show, man, dropping some crazy info. Uh, crazy game about um, about cold calling, you know. So Cordero is a master cold caller. Let me go ahead, go ahead and throw him in the close Olympics, man. <laughs> hey, I don't know right now. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. Cordero, buddy, go back and forth with the best of them. But uh, but yeah, man, he do a good job cold calling. But just the, you know, just the approach, you know, the approach is good. And I think it, it it gets a good response. So, um, but anyway, so let's go ahead and shout some people out. Jamie Buck coming coming through. My guy, what's going on? Jamie Buck, what's up, man? You gonna be at the meetup tonight, man? Over in, uh, over in Douglasville, man. You gotta you gotta come through. But um, but yeah, man. Cordero coming back. Uh, we might as well go a little bit deeper into that to that cold calling. Um, yeah. We really just kind of did the intro last time, so what we'll do is we'll go talk about cold calling, talk about next steps and stuff like that, and then um, we'll pull up this contract, and uh, I got to write a contract for somebody, but my VA went down, at least her computer went down, so <laughs> I'm going to write up this uh, contract real quick right here with you guys so you can see kind of what's going on you know so but anyways man Cordero what, what, what is what has been like wholesaling man how you feeling what you thinking stuff like that man it's been crazy I could tell and I know we've talked a lot about this I could tell that I feel like it was a little bit of a dip or maybe a setback and just how the market was responding but I feel like it's coming back um I don't want to, you know, make any early predictions or say it's coming back, but I know as it's starting to heat up, I'm starting to see a lot more traction, a lot more buyers, most importantly. And I'm gauging that response based upon the buyers. But, um, man, me, I'm just dealing with um, my own set of challenges and problems. Uh, but that's really what this business is about. Uh, but trying to figure out, like, I had to leave VA. And as I don't know where everybody else is in their – in their journey or as far as they how they had their system set up. But notice Byron has to <laughs> Byron has to type a contract out because his lead VA isn't here. And so he was just like, man, he was telling me, Tim, man, I ain't wrote a contract in a long time. And I like, that's crazy. You gotta think about that. That's crazy because most of us is like, let me do a deal. I'm gonna do every part of the deal. Byron don't even remember almost how to set up a, like, a contract. Yeah. So a lot of it does uh you can set a lot of your stuff up on that lead VA and my lead VA she you know she's out so I'm trying to find a new lead VA to help me with some of those tasks and just um put together systems that really work uh better just to kind of make sure that I'm 10x in everything. I want to do more cold calls, I want to do more follow-ups, I want to do more conversions, I want to send out more offers, 10 times more of everything, more offers. Uh, more follow-ups, more contracts actually sent out um, and things like that. Um, pretty much. That's what I'm trying to figure out how to do the most efficiently and, and just keep it going. I think the number one thing is increase the lead flow. If you increase that lead flow, man, you know, you just got to get in front of more people, more marketing, more marketing, get in front of people, get in front of people. That's going to increase your lead flow. If you increase that lead flow, and then the rest of it is just, you know, and then, yeah. that didn't allow you room to mess up. You know what I'm saying? It's like, so true. Yeah, increase that lead flow. It's like, you know, you don't get that one deal, it don't even matter. Cause you got all these other leads that you, you know, you're working on them too. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Kind of like, hey, do you want to take one shot for the game or do you want to take 10 shots for the game? You know what I'm saying? It's like, you only exactly. got one shot, you miss that joke, boop, yo, right? But you get to take 10 shots. You may miss some. You may make some. You know what I'm saying? But making yeah. deals, you know, even if, 
let's say you are, you had a hundred percent conversion rate, but you only getting you know one deal a month. Yeah, you know you really right? don't want to be at a hundred percent conversion rate. I may be at a twenty percent conversion rate, but I'm bringing in a hundred leads. You know what I'm saying? So it's all about getting out there, marketing, bringing in leads, 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 leads. Right. <laughs> Well, I don't want to say you don't want to be at 100 percent, but ideally, if you're doing it, you know, it is better to have a lower conversion rate and more leads coming in that you're dealing with than to just have what Byron is saying. It's just like you take one shot and you convert in it, but it's only one. Um, and thing I'm learning, too, is. It's OK in the beginning, you want it's not necessarily quality versus quantity, but in the beginning you want to focus on quantity and then that brings in the quality. That's how I got to a point where I could talk to people on the phone. So, so fluidly, cause I sucked at it for a while and I was willing to do talk, talk to people, talk to people, talk to people, talk to people, talk to people and not be perfect until I got better at it. But you just want to increase everything you do. So that way, the margin for error is a lot, you know, you got a lot more room to mess up. Like Byron is saying, you can mess up. But um, I heard somebody say, as far as realtors go, there's a saying that you got a list to last. And that just basically means that they, you want to focus on getting those finding leads, finding people who want to sell their house. And if you can master that, you'll stay in the game. And so you want to always have a whole bunch of people who want to sell their house. So turn that up. So turning my cold calling up, I've been um, interviewing more uh, what VAs for help me with my cold calling and stuff like that. I've been that's a pretty good people, too. So we're going to see how that goes. I'm just trying to turn everything up like Byron said. You got to turn it up, man. You got to turn it up. You know, uh, I was just looking. Kobe took 46 shots. When he mm. scored 81 points. He took 46 shots. Right? Like, if yeah. you don't take 46 shots, then you don't score 81. Yeah. Like, people want to like, oh, why ain't I doing what you're doing? Why ain't I doing it? Because you ain't taking the shots. Yeah. Like, you got to take the shots, man. You got to take the shots. Yeah. Right? And, and to that costs, point. It, it costs to get the ball. To get the ball, it's going to cost you. You know yeah. To take your shots, it's gonna cost you to take those shots, man. They ain't giving away for free to get in front of them sellers, man. To get in front of them sellers to be able to shoot your shot, it exactly. may cost you. You know what I'm saying? Hey, but if you can get in front of enough sellers, you may end up scoring 81. <laughs> and do not be afraid to miss those shots. And I think, and it just depends on where you at, because obviously, if you're more of a beginner, I think that that was a hurdle. A lot of people from the outset had to. To, to jump over it's like man I'm afraid to miss the shot yeah but the thing is it's like a rookie you know what I'm saying you got a rookie that's out there and if he's scared what's gonna happen is he gonna make the shot or miss it nah he ain't gonna make the team he's gonna cut him and miss it but jokers out there that ain't got no fear <laughs> they just out there just they throw him up yeah. just drop him that confidence man you gotta you gotta be like man give me the rock I'm, I'm putting him up <laughs> yeah Absolutely. And two, it's a different mindset because at that point, I'm thinking about, man, I want to be the best out here. I want to make 80 points. I want to make 100 points. You worried about missing a shot? This guy's like, I ain't worried. He's not thinking about missing nothing. He's not thinking about missing or man. He's thinking about 80 points. He's thinking about being the best out here, period. So it's not, yeah, I, I, of course you're going to miss some, whatever. I'm not even thinking about whether I'm going to miss it or make it. The rookie's still thinking, I'm scared to miss it. I won't put the shot up because I'm scared to miss it. The guy who's going, it, he ain't even, he's just thinking about being the best. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not, it didn't cross his mind whether or not he was going to miss or make the shot. He's just like, man, I'm putting up shots, period. No doubt, man. No doubt. So, but yeah, man, I think you just got to get out there and put increase them leads. And once you increase the leads, like that's what happened to me. Like that's how I figured out the system. Because the lead flow was so strong that it was like, okay, you know, let's do this and let's do that. The, the streamline this to make this easier. Yeah. It, was like, it was the increase, you know, it was the amount of leads that was coming in that kind of helped create the system. I started looking back like, okay, how did we handle these leads? Okay, you know, we got to do this stuff and this stuff and this stuff. Okay, let's streamline this thing because you got all these leads coming in. It's like right. this streamline how we handle the leads, 
right? Okay, yeah. how do we qualify a lead? Let's break that down. Bam, qualify, basic, basic, qualify, qualify. Okay, once that person is qualified, then what happens, right? How, yeah. do we, how do we come to an offer for that person? You know, how do we come to a verbal offer? How do we come to an actual offer, right? You know, how do we send this to buyers, you know, and just streamlining that entire process, breaking each step down. Um, and man, that that really, that really helped, man. Um, and I don't know exactly where I got that from, but at some point I started doing that with almost everything. <laughs> it was like well, we, 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 little steps, like yeah. little bitty steps and streamlining it. Little bitty steps. It's like, okay, what's yeah. the very, very first step? Okay, what's the very, very next step? And then just looking at each step and streamline, okay, this all right, how do you do this step? Okay, how do you do the next step? And then you know, teaching that. And then just connecting those steps. Yeah. All right. So, okay. First of all, how does the lead get into my system? Period. Like, how does the lead get into the system to be called or text? Like, who put your lead in the system? Who? I, I'm still doing that, man. I don't have an admin VA. As far as like pulling it off, I'm still pulling it. I'm skip tracing it and then so upload it. So like me, I still pull my list. I still skip trace my list. But once the skip trace, like I could go back. Like I started in, but I can go back and teach mm -hmm. them how to do other stuff too. Yeah. But I'm at the point where it's like, if it's skip trace, the VA goes in there and take that skip trace. They know how to export it. They know how to upload it into the tech platform, column platform, whatever. They know how to upload it. They know how to create campaigns. They know how to begin to text or call people. You know, they know all those different, they know how to qualify. They know how to send the messages out, initial messages out. They know how to qualify the lead. They know how to push in the post. They know what to do next and next and next. And like, once it gets into my text platform, every all the other stuff is taken care of. Yeah. Like the deal could basically close. Like I could go away and that deal would still close. <laughs> yeah. Like I could go away and the deal would still like I I could go away and that deal would still close. Absolutely. Just, it's stuff in place and the people know what to do. And so how long from you know getting your first deal to um getting a, a, some type of system and putting those right people in the right places? to where you could confidently step back, did that take you? And why do you think it took that much time? Well, I think it, first I'm going to say, it, I think it took that much time because, um, you know, I was teaching, I was doing other stuff. I really yeah. got, like, focused on it. And then it took that much time because it was like, you get, you know, uh, I, think, I don't know if you said this, somebody else said it, it's like, they can't do it as good as me. You know I was <laughs> and then I started reading stuff and listening to Michael Gerber and all that. Yeah. Um, and somebody else said something else. It's like, dude, they don't have to be as good as you. They just need to be able to get the job done. Right. And yeah. I went to keep every um thing. And it was a dude named Monty that was there. He did his whole system using VAs. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Uh, and Max Max with whole system VAs. But Monty said, like, the VA will be able to do whatever you teach them to do. Doesn't yeah. matter what it is. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. So you can teach them the process. Doesn't matter what it is. They can do it. Yeah. <laughs> and you got to believe that they can do it. Let them make mistakes. And because you got so many leads coming in, they can make a couple of mistakes, you know, and still, still, yeah. Get to so it took me, I would say it took me probably to be able to do that. It probably took me about, um, kind of happened in stages because like at first I was doing everything and then it was like, okay, I stopped doing acquisitions. And then it was like, I stopped doing the admin stuff. And then, then it became, I stopped doing disposition stuff, you know? So yeah. like that was the evolution, but the whole thing probably took me, 
maybe it took me two years because gotcha. I was teaching, you know, I was teaching and I really wasn't focused at first. I wasn't even worried about it being a business. Then once I realized it was a business, then I started reading all that stuff. And then my focus was on building systems, building systems, business, build systems, put people in positions and let those people work. Like that's yeah. what became the focus um, so that I can streamline and I can get more and more. But thing right now is the best the system has ran just because it's like, and I was thinking about that this morning. It's like, I the only thing I need to do, I got a system. All they need to do is feed it. Like <laughs> you just gotta feed it, man. You know, yeah. just keep feeding, 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 feeding. So yeah. that's what I've been kind of focused on now. Yeah, that's what I think that that was big because it was definitely me. I was talking about, ah, but they're not as good as me, and I knew that because I've heard that from so many places. It's like that's a hurdle that a lot of people kind of have to jump over when you realize that, like you said, one, it's a business. And you can't be a solopreneur. You can't do that. You can only do that for so long. But I've been going back and also reading the E-Myth. Um, and Keithon pointed it out to me as well. But it's just like the idea is you want to be able to base your business, your, your business model on a predictable result. You yeah. want to be able to say this is how we can do it and we can deliver this every single time this exact way. Uh, and that's what uh, Byron is talking about when he's you have to have a way that you do things, which is why you'll notice when we talk about the cold calling script. That's why I do it that way. And I teach my VAs to do it that way, because that's the way that we do it. And because we want to deliver a predictable result every time I can't deliver a predictable result every time if the entire business is dependent upon me and me alone. I can't I won't be able to get, you know, do it the same way every time if it's dependent on me or any individual person, period. It's about having that system. This is how we do it. This is step one, step two, step three, as opposed to because what what could happen is Byron could hire somebody to let's say he hires an admin to upload his list and they're uploading their list based upon how they was taught from a previous employer, or how they know to do it and not by the way that Byron said to do it. Then when he hires that person, they're going to do it a certain way. And then if something happens, you know, he has to replace that person or add new people to help them. Then they're going to do it a different way. They're going to do it a different way, yada, yada, yada. And it's not based upon a predictable result. So the outcome to maybe the sellers that you're working with or the outcome ultimately is to get deals closed from prospect to lead to to acquisitions to dispo to close it's not going to be the same every time. And that's really what trips you up. And because people's whole idea is like, how do I create a business where we can do it the same way every single time? And if you don't base your business upon predictable results, then you won't do it. That's why I got to you got to let go, because if I'm the one cold calling, then it's based upon Cordero skills and not just a, a you know, my business. Hey, so Cordero got skills, though. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I need to write those down and kind of make those, uh, which I do. Actually, I have, you know, the cold calling position, I have that. The narrow secret cold calling script. <laughs> step by step. <laughs> one question, though, that I did want to ask, one last question about that. It, would you say, is there a particular order that you, because you said it happened in stages. Like, first it was, I think you said acquisitions, and then it was admin, and then, you know, that you kind of backed off and put some. Is there a particular order, or is it just kind of however, or is there well, a way? That's just kind of how it went for me, because, like, I brought on a VA, mm -hmm. and that VA was cold calling. I was like, okay, I need somebody that can do some more stuff. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I started letting them do some more stuff, like write contracts and stuff like that. But then I went to Keith Everett event. I went to another event in Miami. And they was they were saying like, "Oh, you need um, a lead manager. You need somebody to manage leads." So yeah. I got somebody to start managing my leads. They started doing my follow ups, um, and then that's when I really started putting the good stuff together and started seeing that oh, dang, I could really get people to be in these positions and they can actually do the stuff. So I had started having VAs doing the dispositions. Sending stuff out of buyers, getting offers back, and stuff like that. And then, so I taught them how. To, then I went and like, oh dang, I gotta go backwards. Teach them how to do, how to upload the stuff to the system. So I ain't gotta do none of the uploading. 
So I basically started figuring out like, everything that I do, okay, yeah. let me teach them so I don't have to do it no more. Yeah. <laughs> so you teach them. And, and uh, I also started building a manual for my company. Like I started building out a manual. Okay, yeah. this is how we do everything, right? Manual. Okay, first thing we do, second thing we do, the whole process and writing out all the stuff, every step of what we do. So yeah. we to come in and follow, right? So just be like that's what I started doing. So I went acquisitions, then I went admin, then I went marketing, then I went dispositions. And I think it worked. Oh, I went transactions first. And then I went dispositions. I was like, should I bring in the dispositions or transactions? Like, man, I hate dealing with these darn transactions, man. Bring me a transaction person in. Yeah. A disposition person in. So like that's my like that was my big thing. So that's where I'm at right now. I really need to give up all the marketing. Like let the VA do completely do the marketing. Just set up a system. I can tweak it whenever I want to tweak it, but it's yeah. all written down. And then the VA just follow what's written. You know what I'm saying? And if I want to change what's written, I change it. And let them know, hey, look, that's been changing to the marketing strategy. You know, make sure to check it out. You know, whatever. So, like, that's what, yeah. that's what I need to do. That's big. That's absolutely big. Like, um, having everything written down is what I'm saying. Because now you got that. Now you have a predictable result every time and also from i want to say the customer or we could just say the seller from their perspective it's just like y'all know they they when they sign on with you they feel they probably feel like ah oh, these people know what they're doing they taking care of business and they said they can do it and they can deliver on it um and that's why i've, I've learned this from you and i've been writing down my um my operations manual and i got it you know I'm working on every step, you know, I'm, I'm building it out step by step. But um, one thing I did was actually, and this is a great tip for people, is like, I went back and I asked the seller that I was working with that I did not close their property. They sold their property, but I didn't close on it. It was somebody else. And I reached out to him. I said, hey, what, you know, what, what did we do? What could we have done better? Yada, yada, yada. And she basically said um, something about uh how we kind of set up and also it was somebody that we sent out to the property like a buyer that we sent out to the property and basically they said like they just kind of didn't appreciate his um you know his demeanor when he came to the property yeah. or whatever <laughs> nah, yeah. right. I'm shouting out Anita. <laughs> go ahead hey anita um but I, I say that to say what what it gave me insight on is from the outside looking in your your the people you work with they have a perception of your company or at least you if you're gonna get on the phone and talk to them they're gonna have a perception from the beginning from the first time that they're contacted from the first time that they're talked to or whatever so when you work on these things and get them defi uh, uh, defined perfectly like byron was talking about getting them written out having a way and tweaking it as necessary is it, it make it um you're doing a better service to them you're able to get these people's house sold. You're able to get them to the closing table a lot more streamlined and without a lot of less uh, headache and stuff like that. So that's another value in just getting everything uh, written out. So yeah, that's what I'm working on. Yeah, man. Speaking of sellers, speaking of talking to sellers, speaking of dealing with sellers, Cordero, the man, the cold calling <laughs> the beast, uh, yeah. was talking to us last time about his approach and how he began conversations with sellers, um, just talking about how he's not assuming that, you know, the information he has is the correct information. Yeah. Just like not letting the seller know that you know a lot about it, because you really don't necessarily know a lot about them, right? Mm -hmm. You're just trying to see, hey, is, you know, kind of, is this right? You know, have I reached the right person? Is, you know, am I even in the right place here? And then once they confirm that stuff, then kind of going into action about them being interested in selling it. So take us from there, Cordero. Okay, you check to make sure that it's them. You check to make sure it's their property. It is their property, right? So where do you go from there? After the little intro, where do you go? Mm -hmm. 
Good. Yeah. Um, and so obviously, like you said, the, the, the very next question after getting all of that out of the way is, hey, just want to know if you were thinking of selling your property at this time. I, I like to have that question first. Obviously, I need to know if you're actually interested in selling. And you and I both know because we talk. Well, we all probably know at this point that that could generate a number about six or seven different responses. You know, are you interested in selling a million dollars? Are you interested in selling? Uh, it depends on what you're offering, et cetera, et cetera. But once you've determined, yes, that they are interested in selling and they're like, yeah, actually, I would be, you know, we're thinking about it or uh, actually, you know, then there's four things that this is the meat of the call before I go to the outro. Um, and there's four things that we're really talking about. And that's uh, condition of the property, uh, timeline that they need to get it sold within, motivation, why are they selling, and price. How much do they need? How much do they really need? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and honestly, and we was talking about this before, I... For me, I honestly, this is why some people use a lead, uh, a, 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 what is it called, a scorecard or something like that to yeah. determine um, each the value of your customers or your sellers or whoever your you know your people are, your prospects are. Uh, I don't think any one particular of those four things are just that much more important because if you got a major condition, but because they owe so much on the property, they can't get the price that we need to work, or you got somebody. Um, you know, or, or excuse me, a major motivation, but they owe so much we can't get it to work. Or you got somebody uh, who has a good price, but when you go look at it, the condition, nobody want to buy it. The property is just, a, you know, it's just trash. But I know one thing, though, that I do prioritize and, I, you know, Keith on mentioned this as well is the motivation. I'll, I'll say this, you know, we can get off into how we're going over each four of those things. I usually go condition first, timeline second. I'm building rapport the whole way. But once you can strike that motivation and figure out what it is, you want to start digging deep off into that. You want to really get a, to the best you can. And the reason and, and um, I guess I'll take a step back. You know, I, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but I once after I've determined Yes, you are interested in selling. I'm going to start asking about the condition of the property just because that's just the simp for me. That's just a simple thing to get the conversation, really the meat of the conversation initiated. OK, can you tell me a little bit about the condition of the property? Have you done any work to it or anything like that? Because that lets them know that obviously I'm calling about the property. Um, you know, they'll say they can say a lot of things They could be like. Uh, well, you called me. You you should know about the property. You know stuff like that. You know, I just always let them know. Uh, well, obviously, you haven't showed me the property, so we haven't seen the inside or the interior of it. I don't know exactly how it looks right now. Could you could you as the owner, you know more about the property than I do. To let me know about it, um, and, and you know, let them start to dive into it. But what I'm focusing on in the beginning is rapport, yeah. and that's kind of what we were starting to do. In the intro, if you notice when I'm, hey, I, I don't know if I have the right, I'm trying to come off the right way. I'm not trying to come off too abrasive because I'm just creating a blank slate. But once I start to get off into the meat of it, I want to actually start to build rapport. So if they tell it, you know, if they're like, yeah, it, people love to talk about their property, whether it's trash or whether it's a new build. Yeah, we just put the new countertop, you know, whatever, you know. <laughs> And, I, and I'm listening to them. I'm actively listening to them. I'm not just fake listening to them. I'm really genuinely listening to what they have to say. Um, OK, yeah, absolutely. Did you do all that work yourself? And a lot of the. This is something I don't know if I mentioned on the last one, but it's big tonality. Tonality is something from the beginning that I was doing, and it really comes into play by the time we start asking about condition, time, motivation and price. But tonality. Is something that you start off with. So tonality, if you have a trouble uh, figuring this out, it can be really easily. I teach my VAs this. Two things is important. The, the tempo or the speed at which they're talking. Some people talk faster. Some people talk kind of slow. They're just relaxed. They're cool. <laughs> so you want to speed it up or slow it down in volume. Those two things, if you can mirror that. Some people are, are louder. Hey, I, I don't know if I, I have the right you know, number, you know, you got to meet, meet them where they're at. And some people are 
it sounds like they they in bed no matter what time you call it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't want to be yelling at that person. They're like, hey, um, yeah, who is this? How can I help you? You don't want to be like, hey, I'm trying to call about, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you want to be right, you know, right where they at. Meet them where they're at. And there's a lot of other things that go into tonality. But the two things, write this down and remember it, the, the tempo and the volume. If you master that, you're going to meet them where they're at. Um, and that's going to really help. So once you start to get off into condition, they'll feel a lot more comfortable sharing with you stuff about the property. And then I always I have a script where I teach my VAs. This is what you need to ask. And then you once they answer your question, you have to respond to their uh, question uh, with empathy or just acknowledge that you understand. Oh, oh, absolutely. So if they're like, yeah, we just put new countertops in um, and uh, we just updated the, the whole kitchen. You could be like, OK, yeah, absolutely. I know countertops take a long time to to get in. I'm sure that was kind of a little bit of a process. Acknowledge the question and then go into the next question. Never, yeah. never, ever, I, this is how I teach my VAs. Never just say, um, okay, and when do you want to sell? You know what I mean? <laughs> it's a lot of people just do that and it's fine. But here's what I'm trying, here's what I'm actively trying to do. I'm trying to build rapport. I'm, I'm asking those for one reason and one reason alone to build rapport and build confidence. And we're having a real genuine conversation. So that way, why, by the time we get to motivation, now they're comfortable talking to me. You can't be just short winded with a person and then get to motivation and then think you're going to just engage in some sort of deep conversation with them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? To, up until now, it's been a just a brief exchange. Why would we go deeper and deeper? So yeah. and I'm sure other people have different ways, but that's just my strategy on going about it is let's start building a rapport from the beginning of the call all the way up until we get to talking about the motivation, which I'm, I'm going to talk about timeline, uh, but all the way up until we get to motivation. Um, and then once we get there, we can dive deep off into that. Um, yeah, I think yeah. so. I think, I think that's good, man. Um, one thing that I try to do, I don't know, you know, I'm not the cold call guru like you, but, uh, <laughs> but one thing I try to do is like pull from something that we might have in common, right? Yeah. You know, if, if it's anything that I might, you know, that they might bring up or anything, try to find something that you have in common, right? Absolutely. So, you know, if they live in a certain area or something like that, it's like, oh, exactly. you live on this road, mention another road that is close by or mention some place that is close by or something. You know, right. sometimes I ask people, it's like, how long have you been in the area, right? Or how yeah. long have you owned the property? And then they start to talk. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Yeah, I bought that back in da, 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 when this, 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 that happened. I'm just listening for something I can relate to, right? Uh, anything I can pull and relate to. And like, oh, yeah, I remember when da, 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 da. And then next thing you know, you know, people, you know, you didn't found some type of connection, right? You yeah. know, they, you know, so like that's the thing. Try to find that connection. Try to find something that you guys can both talk about. Right, it's like you know about this, and I know about this, and we can talk about this, right? So I think that's one big thing, man. To be able, yeah. at least that's what I try to do, um, and that kind of made people feel a little bit more comfortable. Like, oh yeah, for the, he knows this. Oh okay, you know, man. I'm telling you, absolutely, and that's why I was gonna say. So the meat of it is condition, time, motivation, and price. But you always want to have what what I call probing questions. And I learned this from my sales background is you, well, actually not even from sales. I, I used to work in a call center and they talked about those probing questions. And our whole job was, I worked with Verizon and they would call in, you got to fix a person's cell phone. You got to fix a person's cell phone over the phone. Like that yeah. means audibly. So in order for me to accurately solve your problem, I have to ask good questions, period. You got to be able to ask a lot of questions. And so for Byron to find that connection, he had to ask, so how long you been there? So there are a couple of probing questions that you can just uh, just drop in. But, you know, I, the better you get at it, the more you can just kind of, you know, create new ones on the fly or whatever. But those probing questions that really ha help you, like like you yeah. said, uh, how long have you been there? How long have you owned the property? Um, is You know, is this a property you live in or is it an investment property with tenants? Um you know, did you do that work yourself? Like when we're talking about the condition, I might ask, did you do all that work yourself or did you hire somebody? 
That's not a question that I necessarily need to know. But it's again to build rapport, because if the person starts saying, oh, yeah, I did it all myself, then I can say, oh, man, you, you, you're a contractor. Are you in the business yourself? Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. we talking, you know, even, you know, my name is Cordero, which actually is Spanish for lamb. It means lamb in Spanish. And oh. if I talk to a, you know, I, I know a little bit of Spanish. If I talk to a Hispanic person, I, you know, and I could tell just to make them feel more comfortable with talking to me, I'll say my name is Cordero. I don't say my name is Cordero. I'd be like, my name is Cordero. I was calling to speak to Jesus. You know what I mean? And that give and they always open up a lot more because they, you know, they can tell that I'm going to understand them and I'll probably be a, a, a better person to talk to than somebody yeah. who doesn't yeah. speak. I'm yeah. literally speaking their language. Um, yeah. and I need to work on my Spanish actually because it's a lot more. You know, really need to work on that. But just in general, in order to be able to establish those connection points, you got to be able to ask probing questions. So think about those probing questions that you want to include in there and you can build on your report from there. Yeah. Are you from the area? Oh, you, you from here? I used to go to school. You yeah. know, you know, and sometimes it's probing statements, too. So. Yeah. You know, so maybe you looking at the properties like, yeah, this is like a solid property. You know what I'm yeah. saying? There's a lot <laughs> of people take pride in their property. You know what I'm saying? So it's like. I tell people, oh, dang, you got a great property here. I mean, I can tell by the way that it looks online that you've done a good job keeping it up. And you know what I'm saying? So sometimes you compliment them or just like, man, this property is in a great location. You know, um, oh, yeah. you know, it's just probing compliments. If you give them any compliment and then just be quiet, people just start talking. They just start talking. They go tell you the story. If you compliment them, they got to tell you the story, man. They yeah. got to tell you the story. Oh, you've been the great area to live in. Oh, here we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's in a great location. And you, I, I always say this. I said, you already know it's in a great location. It's next to some great schools. Um, so, you know, and they're like, yeah, yeah, it is. You know? oh, let me talk. I had a VA. Um, she was cold at this, you know, she was my lead manager. That's why I'm like, man, I got to find me a new lead manager. But uh, what she would do, she look at the pictures online and she'd be like, oh, the kitchen, the bathroom looks lovely. She she used to say this on every call and I didn't teach her. <laughs> but the bathroom looks lovely. If I could just live in your bathroom, that would be great. And people would, I'm telling you, they loved her. Because you know I mean? because that's rule number one I learned is like, you will never want to go in and like, hey, man, your property's trash. First of all. <laughs> You know, let them know that it's a good property because then they go. If you do, if you do the opposite of that, they're gonna have a guard up. Like, oh my goodness, he's already trying to establish problems. He's gonna try to get a discount and you know whatever. Let them know because ultimately you can negotiate based upon condition, but that's really where the renegotiation after we come look at it comes into play. It's yeah. the motivation that's the big thing. Which I want to go ahead and get to that, but. Like Byron said, probing questions and probing statements, adding those little details in there throughout the call for one reason, and that's to build rapport or build trust and confidence. And you want that person talking more than you're talking. That's the goal. I know it sounds, you know, it's good to be able to get on there and talk. And some people, they just don't want to open up. So you got to talk until they open up. But ideally, if you if you got a person talking more than you and they're talking 80 percent of the time, you're talking 20 percent of the time. You're usually in a good position because that means that they're motivated. That means that they got something going on and they just can't wait to get it off their chest. Like, whew, I'm glad you called me because, man, I got this and that going on, this and this going on. So, um, but after condition, I get off into, OK, you know, did you have a particular time frame that you wanted to get this sold within or? And usually, honestly, man, if they don't have a time frame, they're like, yeah, whatever. It's like. Mm, you're probably not going to have a motivation, but that doesn't say everything. That's not the end all be all. But if they say 30 days, it's like, hmm. you know, that's always a trigger that should pop up in your head. Um, if they say, yeah, I need to get this done as soon as possible. ASAP. Yeah, I had to do say 30 days this morning. I'm like, whoa, let's get it going. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's Absolutely. get it going. And I love when they give me that timeline because, it, it, you know, once we're talking about price and I'm trying to get them to actual send out the purchase agreement and, and, and you know, I'll say, OK, you know, you said you want to close in 30 days. I want to make sure we go ahead and get the process started so that way we can get the title search and everything out of the way. That way we can close within 30 days. So I'm going to go ahead and send over this purchase agreement. So that way, once you speed up the process, they understand that you're rushing because you're trying to meet their timeline. 
You're not rushing just because you want to go ahead and get the deal done and I want to push you. You're like, well, you said 30 days, so I want to go ahead and get the process started now. And that's why I'm trying to go ahead and get you the purchase agreement. Let's get this signed. Let's get everything. Uh, you know, let's get the ball rolling. Um, but after timeline, if they show you that they have a timeline, that's usually a good sign. If they don't, then that's why you ask the other questions, condition, time, um, motivation. Now, let's talk more because also, too, when it, another thing about time, if they don't say 30 days, me and Byron was just talking about this. If people will be talking to, I've been talking to them for the past two years and they didn't sell right, right away. But we kept following up and staying in front of them once the time was ready, the time was ready. So timeline is an important indicator, but it's not the end all. I think the mo the best one or the most prominent one is going to be the next is motivation right after timeline. And I learned this from Byron. If they stay 30 days, you can always say, is there any particular reason why you need to close in 30 days? Or is there any particular reason why you want to close in, you know, because once you're thinking about when they need to close, then they start thinking of, in order to figure out when in their mind, they have to think about why first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, uh, 30 day. Well, why 30? And they, they're subconsciously, they're like, uh, when do I need to close? Well, I, yeah. <laughs> I got this going on. I got that going on. Well, the tenant, the tenant is going to be moving out. Yeah, you know, yeah, they, yeah. Their lease is ending you yeah. know, on the 15th of this month. So, and, yeah. you know, yeah. days, Man, so I want to close ASAP. Exactly. <laughs> That's why I put timeline and motivation right next to each other. Um, one right, you know, motivation right after time, condition first, just to get the conversation warmed up, and then timeline and motivation. I always put price last because I really want to get the seller thinking about all of these things, and I want to get that information so that way when he comes and says the price, I'm like, but you told me the house was messed up, you told me you need to sell it fast, and this and that, and this and that. So, price is last, but let's talk well, about motivation. I think um, most times, like. If they tell me all that stuff, like you said, they need to sell it fast, probably in great conditions, no, there's no upgrades, and they give me a price that's kind of high, I almost ignore the price. Because all that stuff you said before, they told exactly. me what the price about to be. <laughs> all, all that stuff you said before, your timeline and your motivation told me what the price is about to be. So <laughs> you tell them the price? <laughs> that's why I say, man, especially motivation if they have a real reason if they were just like man i want to get you know i want to get three hundred thousand for this property but i'm actually in, in, in arrears and i'm about to get foreclosed on pretty soon and i need to close in three weeks it's like listen man i know you want three hundred thousand, but what do you need that uh that motivation and, and you and they gave you a real motivation in a real timeline it's like psh, man yeah. that means uh, where where I wrote this down, man. Your your problem becomes your opportunity, and this is true just in general. Because even for yourself, if you look inward and see that I got this issue, it's almost like that concept: the obstacle is the way. Is your problem becomes your opportunity, but also for the seller, when you see that they have a problem, that becomes your opportunity to be the solution. And yeah. so, the solution might be just to get it sold efficiently, uh, a good solid cash offer, and I say this to the sellers all of the time, especially after that, when we start talking about price, money isn't everything. And it's not. We say that all the time. We, we, we always say that. But in this, you'll get to you'll get to negotiating and you get down to the numbers and you'll treat it as if the numbers was the most important thing in the process. And it wasn't because mm -hmm. money isn't everything. And yeah. I've had sellers agree with me on that point, you know, yeah. So, I mean, money isn't everything. Is there anything other than price that you will be looking to get out of this transaction that you really want to, you know, any other reason that you want to sell? Or I'll do what Keith Everett does and he'll say, uh, how would it make you feel? If, if we could take care of, you know, I know you don't want to rent this property out again. The tenants were trash and they trashed it. If we can take this property off your hands um, and close on it in the next 30 days, how would that make you feel? And the only, you can't ask that question out of the blue. You yeah. had to have some rapport with them first. You know what I mean? You had to have, you know, instill some confidence with the conversation thus far. And then you get to a point where you say, well, you know, how would that make you? And so take your time. I always take my time on the calls. If it's a good person, I'm taking my time and getting it right. Uh, and so how, you know, how would that make you feel? And we're talking about the problem and what the solution would do for them. 
Yeah. That's what we're talking about. It ain't about the price. It's not about the money. Yeah. You know, just it's more the money. I that's why I called that one seller back that I told you guys about was I had to call that seller back because they we went back and forth and they ended up selling it for I think either the same price or I think 5k less than I was going to get them. So I was like, why would why would you it wasn't about the money. It was about their perceived trust in in my company and their confidence in us to, you know, and also they told me it was just like I said that that uh, particular person we sent out to go look at the property, his attitude towards them was was big and they said, "Well, we're going to sell this property one time. We want to feel like we're selling it to the right person." That was him. That and that's not for every seller, but for them that was more important than that extra 5k. So at the end of the day, when they say a price, price is not everything. Don't get hung up on the price if they have a genuine reason and a genuine timeline that they're trying to meet. If and they you have to read people too. You know, there's some people that's going to be more into being treated the right way. Yeah. You put that extra effort into treating them the right way. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? There's some people who's going to be, you know, low maintenance, you know. And you don't have to do all that. It's like some people, you got to find the right buttons to push with yeah. certain people because you know they like this or you know they like that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They want to feel this way or they want to feel that way. You make them feel the way they want to feel. Yeah. You know so, like, that's one big thing. Come Speaking of money and everything, we, had, we just had this guy who wanted 250 for his property. You know, I think he told, said, like, don't talk to us if you ain't 250 or something. Oh, and one of those. Like, like, dude, I'm telling you. But um, but he still was giving us a little bit of a discount. And my thing is, like, somebody giving a discount and they need to close in 30 days, we going for it. You know what I'm saying? It's like I knew I couldn't get him 250, you know, but charge ahead. We charged yeah. ahead. We said yes, 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 until we had to say no. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we say yes, yes, yes. Got the process all the way going. Buyer went out there and looked at it and everything. They came back. They said, uh, what they came back at? They came back at 225. And hmm. so we went and told him, hey, great news. Got you an offer for 200. Right. Uh, <laughs> they came back at 200. Great news. You know. Uh, and we're gonna be able to cover closing costs, no real fees, and we can close the thing in 30 days. You know, yeah. he came back good to go, great news. You know, I'm ready to go, let's move it forward. So, man, and, and, and sometimes you will get, I want to say this sometimes you will get low hanging fruit where it's just about the price, and you give them the price. And you just get it. I, I've had stuff like that happens. But realistically, I'm talking about a repeatable, predictable process where no matter who the seller is, you can achieve that outcome. Um, and notice how Byron on that uh, call. And this is one thing that I realized that works. He was re reiterating what he can offer him. So it's just like, OK, we're at 200. We can close quick, buy all cash, pay as is, no realtor fees, no closing costs and things like that. Um, and so that that's big. Uh, he said, if you can't sweeten the price, you got to sweeten the terms. Um, and so if you if you can't sweeten the price, you got to try to go ahead and sweeten the terms for them or basically position your uh, you buying the house as the solution to whatever the problem is. And so you got to be uh, you got to be able to go ahead and ask the right probing questions to pull that condition out of them, pull that uh, 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 motivation, the reason why they need to sell and really hammer in on that and then position your selling it as, oh yeah, man, well, you want 250? We got 200 for you, but you know we can close quickly. You need to close quickly. You said you want to close quickly. We can do that. Um, so that's just something I believe that uh, probably is ultimately important. I had a seller who they they wanted way too much. They gave us 150. That's the way they started out with. And then I called them. I set up a, a, a follow-up call with them and they instantly said, well, let's do 250. I'm like, they instantly went up to 100K in their asking price. And then I was like, nah. And I went back and forth um, with them. It, 
it wasn't it, it wasn't easy. I kind of got him down to 225. And then we gave him some time. I called him back and I kept reiterating because what they initially told me was price aside, number aside, they let me know very clearly we don't want to fix the property up. We're kind of old. Um you know, they're, we're older, more experienced. We're basically retired. They, if they're not retired, they're on their way to retirement. And they don't want to be fixing properties up. Uh, we don't want to fix this property up. We'd much rather just sell it, but we need 250 So I'm just letting them know, reiterating, okay, we can actually... Um, we can get you. We can get you what you're looking for. We can't do 250, but we can sell it. And I didn't want to know, you know, if you if you guys. And last week, I gave them some time. They had actually started working on the property and doing all the work themselves. And I said, uh, well, if you guys don't want to keep working on it, if you want to just go ahead and sell it as is, I can get you an offer over. It might not be 250, but you know, it's not going to be 225. He said, well, could you do 200? I'm like, hmm, you know what I'm saying? He's coming down. We still need him way lower than that. But it's about solving the problem, though. That's a predictable method. Figure, for, uh, figure out what, they, what their issue is, their reason for selling, their problem that they, that they have, and how you purchasing the property from them can be the solution to that and present it that way. Boom. That's, the, that's the, what you need to do. All of the other stuff that I'm talking about from intro, how we uh, introduce ourselves. Hey, I don't know if I have the right number. All of that is working towards uh, I'm establishing a rapport, establishing a connection. I'm doing all of that just to get to the motivation, just so I can really get to the meat of why they want to sell it. Qualifying them as a, as, you know, as a prospect to make them a lead and I'm establishing rapport just to get to motivation. Then I'm hammering in on what their real problems are and then I'm positioning my solution, which is sell the house. And then you just do that over and over and over again, and you'll get a lot more results. And then um, that's pretty much the meat of it. And um, we can actually make some calls. Wouldn't mind. Um, we can make some calls, um, but I think uh, that's a... Uh, <laughs> that's um probably I think uh, there's also other stuff to do too. Uh, I'll let y'all listen in. But yeah, nah, I'm, I'm over here live right now. Yeah, <laughs> but nobody can hear you. Nobody, nah, nobody can hear you. Nobody can hear you. <laughs> You are crazy, man. Yeah. Yeah, I seen it too. Goodness. Yeah. Yeah. It is what you make it. Oh my goodness. Oh, okay. Hey, what what about that thing in the backyard? Do you think the thing in the backyard is scared some sellers away? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you are in South Georgia, so you know, people ain't even gonna probably be tripping that bad. Yeah. Well, sound good, man. I'm gonna try to make a move on it. I will. All right. Well. Actually, uh, I keep thinking about buyers and sellers, but um, and that's actually a uh, guy that I'm working with that's gonna do the work on the property I'm about to flip, right? Um, so I'm about to flip this property. He doing the work. So I just sent him a uh, real estate agent down there to uh, see the property. I say my real estate agent. It was somebody I, I just called up some agents and I felt good about one. I saw a rehab that was done. She was working with an investor on. That's what I look for. Like when I'm looking to flip, 
I'm looking at here for, for properties that have been rehabbed. And I call that agent that works with an investor because agent, you know, there's certain agents who work with investors, right? Yeah. I mean, there's some agents, you know, they work with investors. They probably know people who can do work on property. So, like, that's what I look for. So I got my guy who doing my work. I got the real estate agent out there. The real estate agent going to tell me what I what I can sell it for. The contractor going to tell me how much I'm going to pay in rehab. So I put all my costs together, right? Yeah. Purchase price is 80 Rehab is 30 So that put me at what, Cordero, 110 Yeah. If the agent can hit me for 5%, let's say 6%, worst case. 6%, let's say we sell for 200000 Um, 6%, then what's that, 12? So 110, yeah. 12, that's 122? Yeah. 122. Yeah. And let's just throw 10K in for closing costs on both sides. Um, that's 132, right? So 132 is my break even. Um, so my he just told me that he talked to the real estate agent. She thought that it could sell for like 180, you know, 190. So let's say I epic fail and don't sell for one. I sell it for 150. I still make, you know, about 20 grand. Yeah. You know, probably 20, 25 grand. So that's epic fail. But hopefully I don't epic fail. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, man. So Rolex, man, what's up? Rolex, you pulling up tonight, man? Rolex pulling up. Rolex, you gotta pull up on me, man. Pull up. Uh Ali says, how often you follow up with your unmotivated sellers, Cordero? Like I said, man. <laughs> uh all the time. So I what I've been working on, that's something I've been working on for a while, but I put them in kind of like categories. And so we're all literally constantly recycling those lists. Like they're con like my goal is to touch, like literally touch them every month. Um, one thing I learned is frequency. Any marketing, any marketing method you choose, frequency is uber important. So if I, so if it's a, un, if I'm calling a cold calling list and it's just a bunch of prospects and these are just people who are just not not interested, not interested, not interested. Those people, I'm going to touch them probably. I'm probably talking to them now, realistically, every two months. Every two months, they're getting a call from me. That's just because, like, I'm going through the whole or, or one of, you know, somebody from my team. I'm going through the whole list and then going back over the whole list and just hitting it, hitting it, hitting it, hitting it. Uh, but if they said that they were a lead or they were they showed some sort of motivation and then we put them into our CRM and then they kind of went cold on us or whatever, then I'm hitting those people, you know, you know, it just depends on the person. Cause some of them specifically said, call me in three months, call me in six months when my kids graduate or whatever. And I always cut that time in half. So if they say, call me in six months, I'm gonna call them in three months, two or three months. Um, if they say, call me in two months, I'm gonna call them in one month. I always cut that time in half. But if it's just somebody that kind of disappeared, you, Man, I might mess around. And if it was a good person, I might mess around and hit them every day, twice a day. You know what I mean? Like, I'm hitting them. If it, and especially, like, I got this one guy. Oh, my goodness. He was in Kentucky, and it was such a good deal. Hey, shout out to Jordan. Shout, shout out to Jordan, man. Shout out to Jordan, man. Jordan, man. Um, Jordan. But I had this guy in um, Kentucky. It was such a good deal, man. I call him, like, sometimes twice a day. And because because one thing I learned is you never know. Sometimes you'd be like, man, it's just other than ghost to me. But then you get a hold of them. They were like, man, I'm so sorry. I was just so busy with work. I'm ready to go. And that's yeah. happened a lot yeah. more often than you might think. So it's just like just to assume that they just ignoring you. Sometimes they just got stuff going on and they you got to keep staying in front of them. So often. Yeah. real quick. Jordan is the one who got that deal on a contract and the house burned down. Right. Yeah. Man, Jordan, shout out to you, man. Shout oh, out to you. Jordan, dude. That, man, that would have yeah. been so sick. And I know that would have devastated yeah. so many people. Jordan, that happened to Jordan in the next week. He was just like, yeah, I gave the money back. I got another deal, though. Uh -huh. <laughs> or something like that. Like, Jordan. I'm worried now. You got to get the money back. I'm like, oh, wow. I've never heard that. I was telling somebody about that. Oh, man, man. dude. Goodness, man. Shout out to Jordan. <laughs> shout out to Jordan, dude. 
Absolutely. But yeah, man, following up, it, it, frequency is very important. So I would say it depends on the lead and it depends on the prospect. As far as our general list and prospects, people just like, no, not interested. We're hitting them. And honestly, we're not going to take them off the list until they request to be removed. Like they, if they verbally say, take me off your list, I'm not, you know, I'm just going to take them off the list. Yeah. Um, and if they sold the property. Uh, you know, if they just absolutely threaten us, like man, threaten to sue us or uh, cuss us, at, you know that type of stuff. I'm gonna take them off. I heard quick. Uh, what's his name? The dude from Chris Chris Tran or whatever his name is. Chris yeah, Tran. Steve, Tran. Steve. Steve. Yeah. He <laughs> said he did, unless they physically threaten them, like to sue him or to come up to a location or they sold. That's the only time. If they cuss him out. And say f you don't ever call me again he keeps them on or not don't ever call me again if they just say f you kiss you know kept kiss my such and such he gonna call them back you know he keeps yeah. them on he's like man they're gonna stay in unless they threaten yeah. us sometimes people be having a bad day going through something, this and that i'm telling you because like then, I had somebody call somebody and they cuss them out or whatever and then another person call them they be nice they talking to him and they tell what's going on. Like, I've had that before. Crazy, man. I had that. I had a guy literally cuss us out. Don't ever call us again. Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> and I think he even, I forgot what happened, but he cussed us out. Don't ever call us again. And then he emailed us. Yeah. Like, <laughs> he emailed us. It was like, hey, man, y'all still want to buy my property? <laughs> just, I like completely like and then he he reached back out to us and somehow was trying to contact us via email because I think you know we had put him on the DNC list so I don't know if we you know um but he reached back out and we closed that deal so it's just like you never know in a person's mood and like we were saying you never know what people going through too like something could pop up like even if oh yeah I'll never sell this well you didn't anticipate um you know, you getting a, that once in a lifetime job opportunity across the country. You didn't yeah. think about that. This was your forever home until your dream popped up. You never know what, you know. So as far as following up, we're always following up unless they, you know, unless they're on the DNC. We'll put as them on the much DNC. as possible. Frequency is very important. <laughs> like, frequency. I heard and I listened to a lot of like Mark Spain interviews and stuff like that. Even though he's a realtor, a lot of what they say and do, the high, high performing ones can translate over into our business. And he says when he first got started, he did a lot of things, but he was really doing like mailers and he found a neighborhood. You start narrow in on a neighborhood and it, you know, that nobody already has a certain percentage of market share. If they got, uh, I think he said 80% market share, don't even try to touch it. You won't have a chance. Um, but go in and he said, I was I'm sitting out. I don't know how he afforded it because mailers are kind of expensive. But he said he was mailing people every time he had listed a property. He would send out a mailer to everybody. Every time he sold a property, he would send out a mailer to everybody. Every time, every time he got a property under contract, he would send it out and, and he would just send people out a general mailer once a week anyway. So this is like you probably getting mailed three times a week. Every person in that neighborhood is getting hit three times a week or something like that. Um, so he's trying to get known. He's trying to get exactly he he without mentioning 10x rule or Grant Cardone, he was implementing and showing a lot of the stuff that Grant Cardone talks about without even thinking about it. He wanted to be the guy. He wants to be dominate a market. And that's what you kind of got to do when you're thinking about cold calling or following up with your unmotivated, uh, uninterested people, because it's not about just it's not about just talking to a person, they're motivated and we get the deal done. It's like, I want to be top of mind when you are ready to sell at least. You know what I mean? That's really the goal of all of this is if you're going to do it, that's the only way to do it. So frequency is important just because when they are ready, who they going to think about? The person that they've seen the most. The person that they've seen the most or the person that they, that they acknowledge the most. So even with people who never make it to our CRM, we're following up with them all of the time. I, I can't even, honestly, I can't put a number on it. I say probably once every two months, but that's probably not real. It's probably like once a month we're calling these people. Hey, just, and even if we just talk, hey, just wanted to check in and see, you know, if, um, you know, is this still your forever home? Did anything come up? Okay, well, and that's why I like to keep the conversations the way I do um, because it creates, um, 
I don't know how to say it, it kind of creates a tone or atmosphere of, hey, you know, I'm just a guy. I just want to check in, see how are you, how you doing, yada, 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 or whatever. Or we're always, but you got to think they're always people are always calling them anyway. They're getting called. Let's say they're getting called five times a day, regardless. Why not let it be you? Yeah, no doubt, man. No doubt. You got to. The consistency is the key, man. But I always say that's that's life's challenge at anything you do to be consistent at it. That is life's challenge. <laughs> it's life's challenge. But um, but yeah, man, I wanted to go ahead and jump into this contract, man, um, and kind of show y'all how we fill out these contracts. I use Doc Hub, right? Uh, Doc Hub is like a Google platform of DocuSign, like Google form of DocuSign. So what I do is, um, and Cordero, you can talk about kind of how you do this. I really don't fill these out, right? I can't remember the last time I filled one of these out. It's been a long time, right? And uh, I was, you know, I was going to go and do one of these, but thank God my VA's computer came back on. I was like, whew, I don't know, man. I don't know if I can. You know, I don't know if I know how to do it still. <laughs> That's crazy. But, uh, but uh, we're going to go through here and kind of, you know, break this down. You know, a lot of people, even when I was getting started, was like, oh, but contract, contracts, contracts. It's like, dude, the contract is not nearly as scary as you think. At least if you do it this way. Like the old way I was doing it, it may have been scary. Yeah. <laughs> you know, with the amount of money that I needed to earn this money and the uh, due diligence period, like I lost $500. I lost $500 using an old contract I used to use. Lost $500. I'm like, oh my goodness. So, yeah, man, you know, you can lose money, but there's certain things that you can do. And in this contract, you should not lose money. <laughs> you know, you lose money with this contract, then you done said something, you know. You didn't say something you were supposed to be saying, you know. So, but anyways, it's pretty simple. This agreement made, and then I put uh, the date uh, on here, uh, and then between, I put the seller name. So if it was if Cordero was selling his property, um, and I would sell him, you know, I was the buyer, um, and we. You know, Cordero owned 123 Apple Street. Um, and, you know, Arrowville, Tennessee. Um, you know, that's, that's you know, it's pretty easy. You know, date, seller name, your name. If you have an LLC, you put it right there. Um, one thing, like, make sure the seller is the actual seller. Right? I usually do that by going to like prop stream or going by the county uh, website to make sure the seller is the seller. <laughs> yeah, some people out there playing around with you, acting like they the seller, acting like they own that property. They don't. Or sometimes Cordero owns property with somebody else. So yeah. you need to put both of their names on there, right? So, you know, sometimes that's the case. Um, Come down here to price. Cordero gonna sell it to me for two hundred thousand dollars. I like that price, Cordero. Um, especially in Tennessee. Um, and then funds held in escrow. This is the earnest money deposit. Let's say on a two hundred thousand dollar house, how much you put down as a deposit, Cordero? Five hundred dollars. Five hundred. That's that's fair. that's fair. Hey, listen. This is the thing about the earnest money, and I was going to, you know, say some with earnest money. I put down ten dollars on our earnest money. I, I wouldn't recommend doing that. Just put five hundred. If they say, "Nah, I needed this," or you, or if they mention, "Well, I'm talking to somebody else," they're gonna put, you know, two hundred, you know, two thousand or whatever. Then I put put whatever they need. At the end of the day, the buyer's gonna pay their earnest money. Yeah, yeah. So just whatever. Don't don't stress out about earnest money. If they if you got to come in and say, "Well, we put five thousand down or something, something like that," then then. Do it. Make sure it's okay with you know the buyer, or at least you got those funds to put up. Uh, but you know, as you'll see, as Byron reveals the rest of his contract, it's not really that big of a deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember one time I, I ended up putting down twenty eight thousand dollars earnest money. Twenty eight 
$28,000 earnest money. Got the deal done though, right? Made about $25,000 because we, because we was, I was like, you know, how much is the other person putting out insurance money? And then they end up going with somebody else. That person fell through. Yeah. And, and what happened was they had a property that they was closing on and they needed the money. Yeah. And they needed to go with somebody that they knew was gonna, you know, go through. So I uh, like, look, we'll put down twenty eight thousand dollars earnest money, right? Um, and that's kind of what they needed to make sure that they had the money to buy the other property. So it's like, if nothing else, if we don't even follow through, you still gonna get your twenty eight thousand dollars that you need to close over here. Yeah. Right? Did you actually put that up though? Yeah. Like out of your pocket? Yeah, actually put it up, man. Actually put it up. You man, that reminds me. It's, it's all relative. Because because like you know the buyer wasn't gonna put up twenty eight thousand dollars. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, it was, a hedge, it was a hedge fund, so you know they had like oh, six. They got you know they ain't gonna you know they got limits. They're not gonna put up twenty eight thousand dollars. I put up twenty eight thousand dollars because I know they about to come through with it. So. Yeah. Um, and it was a great price. Nothing else. Just buy the property and flip it. You know what I'm saying? So, but yeah, man, that was a crazy one. But anyway, so the balance. Like, I, don't the, out. I don't know if that matters. Um, but can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you good. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll finish this up and then we'll roll out. Right. Um, but anyway, so the balance right here is bam. Damn, right, a little math for you, but you put your calculator in and, and make that happen. Right? Yeah. So, the purchase price minus deposit is how much cash that somebody needs to show up with at closing, right? The buyer, right? Um, and then escrow where you're closing at, the closing at Wiseman Law, and this closing uh, is going to happen on or before. Whatever they try to give yourself time, man. You got to try to give yourself time. So, um, you know, I try to give myself at least 60 days. What, what do you do, Cordero, with the closing time? Yeah, honestly, I mean, I'll start doing it, but I, I'll usually say I try to give myself at least 45 days, yeah. but um, 60 days is good. The more time, the better, obviously. And that this is how I do it is that verbiage where it says on or before, I always point that out to the seller is it says on or before so we're putting it out at this date um just to give everybody enough time but we can always close sooner and i always point that out to the seller when i'm explaining it to them so that way that they're okay with us putting it out 45 60 days or whatever it's like yeah we can do it 60 days just to give everybody time but if you if everything coming into place if our investors are are good to go and you're good to go we can always close at any point and they're like okay so make sure to point that verbiage, having it on or before a certain date is big. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. Um, so this just goes in details, condition of the property is sold as is. Buyer's going to pay all the closing costs, um, access to the property. You know, the buyer's going to be given, you know, access to the property and the other people that you might want to let in, like inspector, contractor, appraiser, all those other people can get access in a reasonable time. And then this is key, right? This contract is contingent upon satisfactory inspection suitable to the purchaser, right? And the way that we approach these contracts is that, you know, I always tell people like, well, unless I'm actually buying them, that, hey, I work with a network of buyers and that these buyers are going to come out and view the property, right? We work with a network of investors, you know, the best to go out there and view the property. If it comes back and he says it's good to go, then we move forward, right? If he says bad, then we don't move forward. If he counters, then we let you know, right? So it's all based on an inspection satisfactory to the investor that's buying, right? So, you know, that's that right there alone. You should never lose money, right? Yeah. Yeah, because is, if the investor goes and look at it, they come back and say, you're good. You get the investor under contract first. Then you come back and tell them, hey, you passed the inspection. 
the investors need to be under contract with zero due diligence left. Yeah. <laughs> and then you tell them, because imagine if you got the uh, investor in the contract, but they got one day of due diligence left and then they back out. <laughs> and then now you just stuck with the seller. No. Because the thing is, if that buyer back out, we go to the seller and let them know, hey, look, you know, the investor that we had, you know, um, is not going to move forward and they forfeit in their earnest money. Well, they get earnest money that's written in our contract. We get the earnest money that the investor put up and we always make the investor put up three times the money that we put up. So we put up a thousand, that investor got to put up three. Right. We put up two, they put up six. Yeah. They're, like, they're gonna put up a lot more than what we put up. So even if this thing fall through, I'm making at least two, three K. Right. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. This is absolutely major because like I said, that's why I was saying ultimately when you said this that one contingency right here is was like a like in like a paradigm shift in business, you know what I mean? When you put that in your contract, because notice there is no inspection contingency. The traditional way is we have a certain amount of time to do our due diligence. And then from that date, so, you know, we signed a contract on the 10th and we got seven days to figure out if we can actually move forward. And then after that seven days to the time we close, then we can't, there's nothing else that we can do. A lot of things can happen. You saw, you, you know, you saw uh, your boy Jordan, the house burnt down. The yeah. <laughs> the property. So it's like doing this, it's like, it's not about a certain time. It doesn't, it just removes that, that time frame to make sure that the pro everything goes perfect. And it just basically says, ultimately it's contingent upon an inspection suitable to purchaser. If you don't want to take it, you obviously don't want to use this to take advantage of the seller and they get all the way to the day of closing and then be like, Hey, I didn't have a buyer to begin with. I ain't know what I'm yeah, yeah, no. We don't do that. If you know, you know, you, you, that's why you put a, a due diligence period in the buyer's con like a inspection period in the buyer's contract to get him a couple of days to go ahead and confirm. And then, yeah. Then once they're locked in, then you go ahead and let the seller know we're locked in. We're good to go. We're heading to the closing table. But yeah. this is so you don't lose out on earnest money or nothing like that. That accompany, uh, accompanied with the fact that you're charging the buyer more earnest money than you're uh, offering to offering the seller is a great little tidbit. Like that's going to change stuff for you. Just get comfortable with doing that. And just make that the way you do things. Don't negotiate with the, the buyers. Oh, can we do it? That's how we do it. Period. That's how we do it, man. <laughs> you got to pay this. You want to pay to play? Because just like Byron was willing to put up 28000 because he knew he was going to make money. And it's money that you, it's not like I'm asking you to pay for the property and pay me this extra money. This money is coming out of the overall purchase price. You're going to pay it anyway in the next 60 days. Put it up. Um, but having this contingency in here, I've been preaching this for a minute since Byron gave it, you know, since I, Byron showed it to me, this is big. This is, this is change it from doing it the old way. So you got to really get all nervous and you can always, if you feel like it's not going right, just let the seller know, Hey, you know, things didn't work out. And here's the, here's the earnest money. Let's go. Yeah. No doubt, man. I think it's really big. And um, I actually got this from Keith Everett. So this is huge. Um, it really helped me. Um, and uh, when I first started doing it, Thad was like, ah, I'm not doing that, not doing that. And then, you know, time went on, went on, went on. And uh, he was like, okay, I'm doing it. <laughs> like, he wanted to do that traditional due diligence period. And I'm like, dude, I'm telling you, you get yourself a headache that you ain't got to have. <laughs> I guess that ain't never lost no earnest money. The one time I lost earnest money, I was like, man, I need to hit Byron. Where is this? <laughs> You know, and I, and I didn't really even have to. It was just because I, I just, first of all, I didn't have this in there and I didn't do a couple of things right. And I, you know, I, I shouldn't have, it, it would be one thing if I was just, I don't know, uh, if it just did, if it just worked itself out that way and I'm a okay with that. But I, it was really, I didn't have to. And having this um, in the contract, just, you know, and, I, and, it, and it's pretty, and, and again, this coupled with being just totally transparent with the seller to begin yeah. with. You know, that's that's the business model that you can put this in there when you're letting them know, hey, 
you know, we work with the net. I always say we work with the network of investors. Yeah, that's what we stuff. say too. And so, you know, and I also give it to them like this. Hey, it's a benefit. We're not just one investor because we are networking investors. That allows us to be able to come in and offer competitive cash offers. Whereas one investor, this is what we can offer. And that's it. With our our network, we can check and see who can get the best offer, the highest and best cash as is offered. And we get it over to you. And then when it comes down to the paperwork, you know, it's contingent upon inspection. And then they know, you know, we're going to look at it now and then we're going to look at it before closing, which is why I'd be like, man, how did how did the house burn down and nobody went to go see it? You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. How, you know, nobody went to go see it, but you know, so they know we're going to look at it and if anything comes up, we can always say, man, if it didn't pass inspection, you know, we can't move forward. Yep, that 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 TV, man, no doubt. Go like the live, man. We over here crushing Cordero giving away all this cold calling gems. We're going through contracts, man. You know, um, this kind of stuff is stuff that we was looking for when we was getting started, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, people that was out there actually doing it, you know, and was actually just sitting down, just breaking stuff down and doing this stuff, so you yeah. know. Uh, we was actually looking for people like this. So yeah, a lot of people was catered towards the newbie wholesaler, how to get your first deal. This is like mostly stuff when you're ready to step off into just getting a pattern, getting off into a rhythm of doing deals and really going out there to provide great value to these homeowners that need to sell their property because there are yeah. real people out here who need to sell. And so this is how you really get off into the rhythm of providing value. And I remember I Byron was the first and probably the only person I found that was talking about how to op- run it like a business and yeah. not how to get one deal. Man, Byron, you got some lives where I could probably repeat them verbatim, like the whole live. <laughs> I'm just all day. I wake up, boom, it's on. You know what I'm saying? I wake up, yeah. up morning routine, but then from, from when it's time to start work, I'm listening to that until I go to sleep and I'm, you know, yeah. starting that <laughs> work. Like yeah. I like so- it. Watch it again and again. Yeah, no doubt, man. I think this way is kind of unique. You don't hear a lot of people talking about, you know, just telling people, hey, we work with a network of investors and get the yeah. investors to go out there and see the property and tell the seller, hey, investors going out there to see the property, you know, <laughs> just just telling people what's going on, you know, you know. Uh, yeah. Most people are telling you, hey, offer that person cash for the property, this and that. Is what, that's why it's so hard to fathom. You know what I'm saying? But like when you process it this way, it should seem easier to fathom. Right? So, yeah. Because you're being at this point, you're being real. Yeah. That's, the same, <laughs> that's the same reason why I do my cold calls, like like the intro. Hey, I don't know if I have the right number because I don't. That's just, <laughs> yeah. honest, I'm not thinking about oh, I, I'm trying to say it this way. I'm literally thinking about I don't know if I have the right number. So I'm just being honest. And I realized that. Just really, it's going to be, it was hard for me personally to really ramp this business up and really believe in this business if I felt like I had to be dishonest at any point in the process. Yeah. For me, it was hard to do that. So being transparent from the beginning to now, like they literally asked me, so, you know, you got somebody, I'm like, yeah, that's the person who's going to purchase the property. Like you remember back in the day, they were like, well, what do you say if your seller wants to meet the buyer? deal with that man send them out there you know <laughs> them out there and they're what you, cool what do you do about earnest money buyer like dude <laughs> we have service providers the buyer is going to provide everything yeah the buyer find earnest money the buyers provide proof of funds you know all that you know so i think it just eliminated a lot of problems and make it a lot simpler man you know, yeah. you got to figure everything out. It's like, what if they ask if we can do this? Just ask the buyer. <laughs> That's yeah. all I do, man. Every time something come up, I just go ask the buyer. It's like, yeah, yeah. that's a question that we have to ask our investors. You know, some investors will do this. Some investors may not do this. But, you know, um, it's a chance that that could happen. But we need to check with our investors. Bam. Absolutely. <laughs> and, it, and you're never at any point you're not you're not trying to uphold some sort of lie 
And I feel like that was the hardest part navigating YouTube University in the beginning because they was all like telling you to, you know, you got to create this wall and act as if you're the buyer. And I'm trying to think, well, what's the next thing to say? If I was the buyer, I would have the answer to this question. Yeah. I'm, not, yeah. <laughs> I'm not the real buyer. So the fact I'm, I'm ashamed to say, I don't know. But now I'm just like completely real with the seller. I'm like, hey, uh, uh, that's a good. I always say that. I never say you don't know. Never say, I don't know, man, because Grant Cardone says nobody likes a guy who not only doesn't know, but doesn't want to know. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know and leave it at that. It's like, well, do you want to know the answer? Are you going to yeah. try to help me get the response? They say, you know, that's a good question. Let me go ahead and reach out to our investor team and see if we'll be able to make that work. And then I'll get back to you. And yeah. that. That's pretty normal. If somebody, if you went to Verizon, it was like, well, can I do this with my phone? Can I get this in plan? And they're like, let me go ask my manager and see. You wouldn't be like, hmm, what's going on here? <laughs> yeah. That make a lot of sense. You yeah. know what I mean? So this is the way. This is definitely the way if you want to ramp it up and, and, and keep going, this is a good system. Man, I think we just crushed this live, man. I think we, I think we crushed it. It's definitely one worth going back and watching so yeah, but anyways man, we finna get out of this thing been on here almost an hour and a half so it's been a long and a good one but we finna get out of this thing hey tonight got the whole sub meet up tonight in Douglasville Georgia at the Starbucks on Chapel Hill Road man right next to the McDonald's so if you're in the area man come by six and check it out I'm gonna be up in this thing teaching about wholesaling man so let's do it Absolutely. And everybody, I don't know the best way to do this, but man, follow me. Follow me on IG. As you can see, I'm trash on uh, Instagram, but I'm trying to get mm -hmm. it. Cordero. We'll tag you below, Cordero. Yes, let's do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Cordero. If you Cordero have any, Martin on IG, right? Yeah, Cordero. I think it's Cordero Martin 615. That's the area code for yeah. uh, Nashville. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you just type in Cordero Martin, there shouldn't be too many of us out there. <laughs> but shoot, all right, man. Appreciate you coming through, Cordero. Until next time, man. Peace out. Peace out.